what I want to do is kind of enter into the mind of Paul for a few minutes. I want to kind of set the stage um, for the topic that I want to talk about. So we're going to study through the Bible a little bit. Hope you've got your Bible um, with you. Look down at Philippians chapter number 3, and then you're going to keep your place in Philippians chapter number 3. Before I even tell you what the sermon's about, we're going to give a little bit of a foundation here. We're going to build, um, we're going to build up a little bit, and then I'm going to hit you with it in just a few minutes. All right. Look down at Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 7, if you would. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, But what things were gained to me, this is Paul speaking, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. All right. So Paul is saying, these things that used to be a gain or a profit to me, I counted them a loss. What is he talking about? Well, if we just jump back a few verses, look down at verse number 4. And Paul tells us what this means. He tells us what these things are. Back in verse number 4, Paul says, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. All right, I'm going to kind of give you an idea um, tonight, and especially at the beginning of this sermon, you know, why God chose Paul for this particular mission. All right, Paul is saying, you know, you think you have confidence in yourself. He's like, nobody had more confidence, more reason for confidence in themselves, in the flesh, than I did. Look at verse number five. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Man, he had the right genealogies, this guy. All right, he was right where he needed to be. Of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. So Paul, if you didn't know this, Paul was a Pharisee, right? And he wasn't just any Pharisee. Paul was at the top of his game, and that's exactly what Paul is trying to explain here as far as the things that he counted lost. So he's saying, this is where I started from, all right? He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He had all the right things going for him. But now look at verse number six. Not only that, not only did he have the right, you know, bloodline, did he have the right relatives, was he a Pharisee, was he, you know, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, but look at this, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So let me start with the end of that verse first. He says, like, as far, he's like, because what were the Jews of this time teaching? They were teaching righteousness of the law. They were teaching what everybody we see teaching today is teaching, which is works-based righteousness. And Paul is saying, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek here, but he's kind of saying, like, look, as far as being justified by the law, if anybody was going to be justified by the law, it was me. I was blameless. I was following everything that I was supposed to be following in this false religion. All right? But, of course, Paul knows, and he says in a few verses down, that you're, no one is justified by the law. But look at the first part of the verse. And this is super important here. And I want to preach a little mini sermon on this for just a couple seconds, just a couple minutes. Look what he says. He says, concerning zeal, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Isn't this interesting? What was Paul doing? What did we see in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 7? Look, when Stephen, the first martyr, was killed, Paul was there. He was hunting Christians. He was going back to, you know, the Pharisees, getting more letters. Like, he was going above and beyond the call of duty to persecute the church, as he admits here in verse number 6. But it's super interesting that Paul had zeal. Paul had zeal. Did Paul get his zeal when he got saved? No, Paul had zeal when he was persecuting the church. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9, if you would. Isaiah chapter number 9. Now, I was out soul winning. This just, this just reminded me of something uh, from yesterday. But I was out soul winning, and I won't mention any names, but I was out soul winning with a, with a teenager yesterday. And it just so happened that I was out soul winning yesterday afternoon um, with one of the teenagers, and this teenager knocked on a door, and two teenagers answered the door. And this teenager, our, our teenager, gave the gospel to these two teenagers who, I mean, I, these two teenagers, it was a very strange situation for me. I saw these two teenagers and they just, they had blank looks on their faces. They were staring down at their feet most of the time. And like this teenager that gave the gospel had the maturity to know when people weren't really connecting and listening. And I was super happy with the gospel presentation 
and, and just the maturity that this, that this young man had giving the gospel, um, a thorough gospel presentation to these two teenagers. But I walked away from the situation and I said to this young man, I said, I couldn't believe that. It's like you were talking to a couple of zombies. I mean, these kids are just like blank looks on their faces. Like, you know, when you would ask them questions, you could barely get a response from one of them. And, 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 and the, this young man, he educated me. He said, oh, this is common today. He said, this is, I mean, these, these kids were his age. These kids were around, they were teenagers too. He said, oh, no, no, no. He's like, this is common today. This is common to see this type of kid today. Because I was like, right, do we need to call like 911 or something? Is some, has someone had a stroke as they're standing here? And he's like, no, 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 you'll, you'll see kids like this all the time. So let me just say this. Paul did not get his zeal. What is zeal? Zeal is, is the desire to be diligent. Zeal takes energy. Zeal is motivation, determination. Paul had zeal before he came here. Before he got saved on the road to Damascus, Paul already had zeal. And God was simply taking what he saw in Paul. He's like, you know what? I need to use that for the gospel. Paul took that zeal and he took it forward to, to further the gospel, maybe, maybe further than any other man on the planet Earth has ever done. But he already had the zeal. It was already there. So let me just say this to young people especially, and this isn't even what the sermon is about, but you better figure out a way to get some zeal in your life. Because what I saw yesterday and what we're seeing in these new generations coming up is not going to work for you. It's not going to work for you anywhere, much less your Christian life. You better figure out a way to get some zeal in your life. And why, is it, why does a 47-year-old man have to stand up and try to convince young people to have energy and zeal in their life? It's sad. But, you know, things that will take away your zeal is, you know, the screen in front of your face, yeah. the drugs that people are doing, the alcohol that people are, are, are drinking. Like it, that's the things that will destroy your zeal for anything. And then, you know, if you do get saved, you'll have no zeal anyway. You've got to find a way to get some zeal. And, you know, dads and moms are like, how do I make sure that my kids have zeal? And look, this isn't just for the young people because guess what? If you're raising kids today and you have no zeal yourself, there is zero chance that your kids will have zeal. You pass it on to your children. You find, you find me some dad that's just out there just taking names, and I'll show you a son that does the same. That's just how it works, folks. Look down at Isaiah chapter 9. So you're saved this evening. You're saved this evening. And let me just show you something from the Bible concerning zeal. Concerning zeal, as Paul says. Look at verse number 6. Talking about a prophecy of Jesus Christ here in verse number 6. For unto us a child is born. Very common verse here. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And look at verse number 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. This is David's kingdom being taken into everlasting here is that messianic promise is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. The throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. And look at this. This is why you're saved, by the way. You say, why am I saved? How does God put up with these sinners on this earth? How could God possibly commend his love toward us while we are yet sinners, while we are yet spitting in his face, while we are doing nothing to, you know, draw him to us, yet he offers us the free gift of salvation through his son anyway. Why? Because the zeal of the Lord of hosts, that's why, will perform this. It is because of God's zeal for us that Jesus Christ was even sent here in the first place. So thank God that he has zeal. So we should try everything that we can possibly do to get some zeal in our lives. And if you're saved and you don't have any zeal, that's shameful. You should find some. 
You should find some zeal in your life. Because the only reason you are saved is because God had zeal for us. And that has nothing to do with the sermon. Go back to Philippians chapter number 3. But Paul is explaining here, Paul is explaining here that he had it all. He had everything. He was at the absolute top of his game. And he says those things are gone now. Those things are lost now. Look at verse number 8 of Philippians chapter number 3. Verse number 8. He says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost. Now you know what he lost. For the excellency of, look at this, the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He's not talking about becoming saved here. And be found in him, look at this, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness with, which, is, which is of God by faith. So he's very clear that he's not talking about works righteousness. He's talking about why he's happy that he counts the things that he lost as nothing, as worthless. And he says it again in verse 10. He says that I may look at this. Don't miss these words. Remember the knowledge of Christ in verse number 8. Look what he says again in verse number 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Look what he says here. He's talking about knowing Christ and having fellowship with the sufferings of Christ, meaning he's understanding the sufferings of Christ, being made conformable unto his death. And then look at verse number 11. That, I may be, that, I, that by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of of the dead. Look, he's going to reach the resurrection of the dead, he just said, through faith. But the point Paul is making is that his sufferings and the things that he has lost help him know Christ. Now go to Matthew chapter number 7 and look at verse number 21. You say, well, didn't he know Christ already? Isn't he saved? Didn't he, didn't he know Christ? Look, this guy spent three years with Jesus. Jesus taught this man personally. And he is sitting here saying that I want to know him better. Think about that for a second. He's saying that I may know Christ. He already knew who Jesus was, right? But look, look at Matthew chapter number, number 7 and look at verse number 21, or verse number 23, sorry. See, once you get saved, Jesus knows you. That's, that's called Jesus knowing you. But in verse number 23, the Bible says, Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. This is Jesus talking to people who are proclaiming themselves righteous through their works. He's saying, I never knew you. So for your salvation's sake, it is important that Jesus knows you or doesn't know you. And if you're saved, Jesus knows you. But now, as Pastor Jimenez said this morning, it is up to you to get to know him. And that's what Paul, somebody who spent three years being taught personally by Jesus Christ in, in Arabia, Paul is saying, I just want to know him better. By any means, whatever it takes, I want to know Jesus better. I mean, just think of the concept. How many people do you know that you don't know that well? This is what we're talking about. How many people do you know that maybe you've known for years, but you don't really know them? Maybe you see him three, four times a year. Maybe there's somebody that you work with, that you've worked with him for years, but you don't really know him. You don't really know him that well. What Paul is talking look, there's too many saved people out there that just don't know Jesus that well. If you're saved, he knows you, and you know enough about him to know that he died for you, and you trust in that. But then they're just like, that's all I need to know. There's too many people like that. There's too many believers out there like that. And Paul is saying, not me. Paul is saying, by any means, I don't care what it takes, I want to know Christ better. Go back to Philippians chapter number 3. Go back to Philippians chapter number 3. Verse number 12. Not as though I had already attained. He's saying, like, I'm never going to get to the point where I, I've got it all. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am 
apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, verse 13, I count my not, my, not myself to have apprehended. He's talking about growing in his faith. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the high pro, of the pro, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse number 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Paul, is just, Paul has just explained to you in the last 10 verses his mindset towards Christ. And he's saying, have my mindset. The mindset of Paul is that the suffering, the loss of all things. And look, he's not even talking about material things. He's talking about status. He's talking about, you know, power. He's talking about, you know, all his colleagues and all, you know, his reputation and all this lost. It's all gone. And he's saying, that's how I want you to be minded. Because all those things help me to know Jesus Christ better. And he already knew him better than any of us know him now. And he's saying, hey, I just want to lose everything just so I can know. So I can identify with his suffering and his death. Look, you know, sometimes we forget. Sometimes we forget. I think maybe we talk about it so much. But sometimes we forget, like, how, what Jesus went through. Sometimes we forget what Jesus Christ went through even before he got to the cross. I mean, I remember, like, I personally remember, like, the hardest moments in my life and, you know, who was there for me and who wasn't. <laughs> like, I remember those times. Imagine Jesus. Everybody abandoned him. Everybody abandoned Jesus Christ. I mean, the disciples ran away. When he was on the cross... When he was on the cross, it was John and a couple women that were there. That was it. Everybody else had run. Everybody else had, had fled. Look at John chapter number 7. Go to John. Even his own family. Even his brethren. His brethren didn't believe in him until he rose again from the dead. His brethren didn't even support him. His brethren even abandoned him. Look at John chapter number 7 and verse number 3. Or actually, just look at verse number 5. Verse number 5, it says, For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then we see in Acts chapter 1 that they finally, you know, some of, some of the brethren anyway were there. But before Jesus went to the cross, even his own family abandoned him. Look at Luke chapter number 9. Look, the point is, Jesus' life was not great on this earth. Luke chapter 9, look at verse number 57. Luke chapter 9, look at verse number 57. It says, It came to pass, and as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whitherso, whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He didn't own anything. He didn't even have a home. He didn't even have a place to go to. He's saying to this guy, he's like, you know, do you understand that if you follow me, like, I don't even have a place to stay. I don't even have a place to, to lay down. Look, this is all before his suffering and death. And Paul is just saying, I want to identify with this. And he's saying, you know what? All this suffering that I'm going through, it's great. And I count everything that I've lost as garbage because this is helping me identify with Christ. Think about this for a second. Just think about like secular re ways people identify with each other. I mean, you see this. To really identify with somebody, you must have experience in that area to truly identify with somebody. This is why you see so many like support groups for, you know, uh, people that have suffered. You know, you think about people that have had struggles. You think about like victims of crime. They have support groups of other people that have been victims of, of crime. Why is that? Because they understand. They can identify with something. You know, people that have been just through horribly traumatic, you know, traumatic experiences like wars and things like that, they have support groups for, you know, that have other people that went through those things in those support groups so they can identify with the suffering that that person is dealing with. But the point is, the suffering helps you identify with somebody else that went through that similar suffering. And that's what Paul is calling out 
in Philippians chapter number three. Now go to Philippians chapter number one. Go to Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. Even in prison, Paul says sort of the same thing. He says a similar thing when he's in prison. Look, Paul suffered a lot. Paul did not have a great time on this earth. He was in a lot of trouble a lot of times. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse number 12. He says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He's in jail right now. He's in prison. He's locked up. Look at verse 13. He says, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all the other places. He's saying, hey, I'm in prison, but the gospel's getting out because of it. Amen. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confidence, confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Here's he's, he's saying, Be, me being in prison is giving others zeal. It's giving others fearlessness. It's giving people that would otherwise be afraid and look, it's kind of, a, it, it's kind of a, an ironic thing. Somebody being in jail would give other people... Look, that's how Christianity works. And that's what I'm going to explain to you tonight. It says, Some in, indeed preach Christ even out of envy and strife. Now it gets, it gets crazy here. And some also of goodwill. Look, there's, he's talking. He's in prison. Think about this for a second. He's in prison, and there's people, there's Christians that are like bad-talking him in, while he's in prison. He's like, some people are out there doing the right thing. And he's like, some people are bad talking. You know, maybe they're like, oh, you know, he shouldn't, he shouldn't have gotten caught or maybe he shouldn't have gone to that town or whatever. People are, are, are having envy and strife against Paul while he's in prison. These are saved people that are doing this. The one, one you know, preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. They're literally trashing him while he's in prison is what he's saying. You're like, man, he must be so mad. He must be just so irritated with these people. But look at verse 17. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. He says, but then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. He's saying, as long as they're preaching the gospel, I don't even care what they're saying about me. He's like, if they're doing the wrong thing, but they're out there and they're preaching Christ, he's like, whatever. I mean, talk about the right attitude. He says, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. Through what? Through more suffering. So Paul is saying, hey, my suffering, it brings me closer to Christ. It brings me, it brings me closer to the knowledge of Jesus, of what he went through. And then he's saying, through my suffering, there's a bunch of jerks out there preaching the gospel, and there's a bunch of other people out there preaching the gospel, but... Whatever, people are preaching the gospel because I'm here. And he's like, praise God for that. He's rejoicing for that. He's like, whatever helps get the gospel out. That, that's okay. He's like, that's what I'm for. But it's interesting because Paul, you know, he's just, he's all about whatever gives people zeal, whatever gets the gospel out, and whatever gets him to know Christ better. That's the mindset of Paul. That's all the introduction of the sermon. The title of the sermon this evening is First World Christians. First World Christians. Now we know where Paul's coming from. Let's look at the other side of the spectrum. You say, well, you know, First World. I even uh, went and looked this up. I, I think I was pretty close to where this saying came from. But what am I talking about, First World? So back in the 1950s, there was some French uh, guy that wrote an article. It was called, like, Three Worlds... It was like one planet, three worlds, or something like that. But this where this idea of the first world, the second world, and the third world came from. So we've all heard of like first world, you know, first world problems, ha huh, huh. And then like third world countries, you know, under, underdeveloped countries. It's probably like, I don't know, it's probably frowned upon to even say that. But what have I ever really had a problem with saying? So the point is, um, the point is that, you know, there's the first world, there's the second world, and there's the third world. And the theory was this. The first world was the, what we would call the West today. All right? This is kind of a Cold War mentality. But the first world was the Western developed nations. The second world was everybody that was with the Soviet Union, all right? which is kind of getting to be a growing, a growing block. If, I know it's not the Soviet Union anymore, but uh, 
the Western, the anti-Western countries that are developed are getting to be, um, it's actually more of a population of the world than the West is. So, but whatever, that's not the point. And then the third world, so there was like the first world, the West, and then there was like communism, the Soviet Union, and all those countries. That was the first and second worlds. And then the third world were people that just like, they didn't have an economy, they didn't have any industry, and they were just under, underdeveloped nations, and they were called the third world. All right, but the point is, the title of the sermon tonight is First World Christians. We're still in the first world. All right, we're still in the first world. These Christians that live, it's all of us that live in this world, that live in this world that's just completely at ease, that it's all about, I mean, look, think about the spectrum here. We have Paul's mindset, and then we have the first world Christian mindset. I mean, think about Paul's mindset. Would you ever rejoice in this way? I mean, our lives in the first world, in the country that we live in, in the West or in the United States or whatever you want to call it, they're all dedicated to just completely removing discomfort and suffering. That is the point of many things in our economy and many things, if you would talk to people in their lives, they're trying to, you know, position themselves better or maybe purchase something or get something to just make things easier for them. Why? Just, I mean, just think of all the, think of all the contraptions that we have. What are, what are all the inventions and the contraptions that we have for? Just to ease suffering, just to ease manual labor, to ease, you know, things. I went into a, a McDonald's uh, a couple days ago and like, there's like nothing in there anymore. Have you noticed? Have anyone been, is mine the only one that's ever been in a McDonald's in the last few weeks? But there's just all these like kiosks and there's not even a soda machine anymore. I had to run in and, and use the restroom, but I was just like, wow, like everything's taken out because everything's going automatic. We just got to like take away all inconvenience, remove all discomfort, and remove any suffering. I mean, that's the opposite of rejoicing in it. This is the problem that Christians have living in the first world. But let me just tell you something this evening. The result of this, the result of this mindset, we have Paul's mindset, and the result of the first world Christian mindset of I just have to remove all inconvenience, all suffering, anything that causes me even the slightest pain and suffering is that we end up as Christians that can handle nothing. We end up as people that can handle nothing. Anything that happens to us to upset our, look, and you check yourself on this. Anything that happens to us to upset our perfect little lives, and we're just, like, we're just brought down to depression. It, and we're not rejoicing over it because we're, like, we're not used to suffering. We're not used to this type of thing. But guess what, folks? This world's getting worse. This first world is getting worse. This country is getting worse. So there's going to be more suffering that's coming. Look, people are getting worse. I hate to break it to you. If you're not noticing this, you're not paying attention. People are getting worse. You know, the progressive thinker today will tell you that, oh, no, we're getting more enlightened today. But let me tell you something. Debauchery is not enlightenment. Confusion about even the basic things about whether you're a boy or a girl is not enlightenment. Perversion of all types is not enlightenment. As it gets worse, we need to expect trouble. And we should welcome it. Just like your baptism, just like a baptism buries you with Christ and identifies you with Christ, suffering also identifies you with Christ. And look, persecution does the same thing. It helps you come into a more perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ. Persecution brings closer to perfection for the Christian. And we should have the heart to want this, if that's what God has in store for us. I mean, but look, Paul, the mindset of Paul, it shows us, it shows us how far we have to go. Because in the first world, the opposite is true. The lack of persecution, it means that we, take, we can handle nothing and we take everything for granted in our lives. And let me just tell you, let me just give you a few things tonight that we all take for granted as first world Christians. 
And it's the opposite of getting more to know Jesus Christ. We, as you live in this world with no suffering and no discomfort at all, you just take all the good things for granted. Think about this for a second. You're all holding a Bible in your hand, are you not? Yeah. Now, I'm not going to ask you about yesterday because we were all out soul winning yesterday, but how many minutes on Friday and Thursday did you read that Bible? Did I catch you? How much time did you spend in your Bible last week? But think about this for a second. What if this was the last day that you had a Bible? Would you read it then? If it was just the last day after, after today, Bibles are illegal. You know that's far, not far-fetched? You know there's countries in the world today where having a Bible will get you killed? get you put in prison, North Korea, amongst many others. See, Americans are allergic to reading, though, especially today. It's the, it's the TikTok, YouTube shorts, all this stuff. Sit down and read a book for three or four hours? I don't think so. I don't even really think I'm going to do too many book studies anymore because I can't even get people in this church to read a book. How are you reading your Bible if you're allergic to reading? You see all this TikTok and all these short little videos? You know what all that is? It's just like, it's the, modern, it's the modern equivalent of not reading, but it's really um, a, the modern equivalent of like one verse Christians. You know these Christians that just like know one verse? And many times they don't even know one verse. They know like part of a verse and then they misquote the verse. You ever heard a Christian say this? Don't judge. It's like, okay, where's that verse? It's, it's not even a whole verse, first of all, and then you just quoted the verse wrong anyway. It's like a false verse. If you didn't have a Bible anymore and today was the last day, would you read it then? But we take these things for granted. We take these things for granted because we're, we're living in this trouble-free Christian life. So we take the perfect Word of God that is sitting on your lap in front of you right now, and you, just, you probably don't even think about it. Most, you know, most minutes of every day. How about this one? The fact that you can preach the gospel. I mean, you can. Hopefully you do. But what if, I mean, just like, what if this was the last week that you could preach the gospel in this country? In so many countries. I mean, I, I've sat with, with Garrett, and we'll just go through countries. I don't know why we do this, but we'll just go through countries sometimes. And it is shocking how many countries where it is literally illegal to evangelize. You know, you can thank the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses for a lot of those countries. But look, it, it's there. I mean, there is a time. There was a time in my life, and I'm sure there was a time in your life, where I thought, where I thought to myself, after I got saved, and I watched other people preaching the gospel, and I watched other people going out soul winning, and there was a time, and my wife and I were talking about this this week, that, you know what, remember that time when we thought, if we could just get one person saved, that would be awesome? But the sad fact is, if you have zeal, I mean, not the sad fact, but the actual fact is you have zeal in your life, you get way more than one person saved. We got 25 people saved in just the last two days with just a handful of soul winners going out. There are so many places where you are literally not allowed to preach the gospel today. But we take it for granted. We take it for granted. How about this one? Homeschooling. Homeschooling. Oh, it's, it's hard and we complain. And, you know, but the Bible says, you know, Teach these words. Teach them diligently. But we take it for granted because it's hard. But imagine if you had to send your kids to public school. Imagine if that was the law. You know that's the law in many Western countries? In many first world countries, you do not have the option to homeschool. Germany. Sweden. Greece. Spain. Netherlands. You cannot homeschool there. It is not a choice that you have. That's just Western countries. But imagine if you had to send your kids there next week. Imagine, I mean, would you, would you take it for granted then? How about this, that you have a church and a church family? 
We take that for granted too. You know that there's still states in the United States. There are still states here. There are still cities in the United States where there are people that want a church just like this one. Where there are people that are, you know, that are saying, you know, they're just begging for someone to plant a church in their city. And look, I could go off on that because it's, it's a real simple problem to solve. Just pack up and just move to a city that has a church. But the point is, if you're in a city that has a church, be thankful that you have one. Do not take it for granted. Just because you don't have, you know, the troubles and the sufferings of people that don't have one. So look, the point I'm trying to get you to see is the spectrum here. I'm trying to get you to see the spectrum between our first world Christianity and what Paul saw. In this first world, we're like, you know what, anything, anything less than, you know, I take this attitude as a first world Christian that anything less than zero problems or anything more than zero problems is just unacceptable to me. And I just won't be able to handle it. I'll just be in depression. And, but look, it's selfish and unrealistic, first of all. When Jesus Christ himself literally tells you that you're going to be persecuted if you follow him, especially for the Christian, but it raises the question. It raises the question I was thinking about when I was writing this sermon. It raises the question that, is it even possible? Turn to Ruth chapter 2. Is it even possible to have everything go right all the time and remain a good Christian? Is it possible, do you think, to have everything just go well for you and never have any trouble and still remain humble to just keep that humility put on you to keep what to keep good character look at Ruth chapter number two look at Ruth chapter number two see Ruth ended up marrying Boaz which ended up being bringing her into the line of Christ but people don't understand a lot of people don't understand that the reason that she had success with Boaz, and Boaz wanted to marry her, it was her character. It wasn't who she was. It wasn't that he was the, the next kinsman or the nearest kinsman. Yeah, that was part of it, but the only reason that he chose to marry her was because of her character. Look at Ruth chapter 2, and look at verse number 7. I'm asking you, is it possible to be a good Christian without suffering? Is it possible to have good character, to remain humble, if you don't have some kind of discomfort and persecution in your life? Look at verse number 7 of Ruth chapter 2. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. She's out there, and she is literally walking behind the harvesters, picking up or hoping for the chance that they will drop something behind them and she is gleaning behind them picking up the scraps that they don't want and happy with picking up the scraps that they don't want you read the rest of the chapter and Boaz watches this woman just work and she looks at her actions and he looks at you know how she takes care selflessly of her mother-in-law who her husband is she's a widow She's, her husband is dead. She's taking care of her mother-in-law. Then go to chapter number 3 and look at verse number 10. He sees her character as she's walking behind and just picking up the scraps behind the harvesters. In verse number 10, Boaz says, And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. This is when she, you know, she wants him to marry her. And he says, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou... He's saying, this is how, this is how I see you. Look what he says. He says, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. He's like, I saw, I saw who you were. I saw you picking up the gleanings. I saw you not chasing after, you know, the, every single guy that walks by. I saw you not chasing after money. He's like, I know who you are. And I saw you toil to take care of your mother-in-law. The point is, struggle shows character. Struggle builds character. And that's what he saw in Ruth. Look, it's up to you if you can keep character when there is no struggle. But many times it does not go well. Many times it does not go well. Look, 
I'm a Gen Xer. I don't know if you all know what that means, but basically you got that it we're in, we're in the we're in definitely in the decline of America today. If you haven't noticed that, like you need to open up your eyes and like read something. Read anything. We're in the decline of America today. And Gen X, my generation is probably only surpassed by one generation on on the generation that had it better than my generation. And that would be the baby boomer generation, the generation of my parents. That was peak America. And most people that are even looking at this halfway close will agree with me on that. And we're on the, look, we're on the downhill decline. But look, it's a high hill. It's a high hill that we're coming down from. But we're on the decline in America. Sure. My generation, I got to fix my mic here. Hang on one second. There we go. My generation and the ease of my generation is only surpassed by one generation before me, but it still is pretty good compared to historically all other generations. And it's the same for you, no matter what generation that you had it. Most people, here's what I'm trying to get you all to understand in this room tonight, because it's a, it's a, we're in decline, but it's a high hill that we're declining from. And history will tell you that too, but the point is this, most people throughout history would look at your life and they would be extremely happy with just the gleanings from your life. They would be extremely happy if you look at our lives as Americans today, people throughout history, Christians throughout history, would happily walk behind us and take our scraps and just be happy with the scraps that we leave behind. That's how first world we are. And that's how far from Paul's mentality that we are today as first world Christians. I mean, I liked what uh, Pastor Jimenez said this morning. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to depress you with the decline of America, but look, as, the, as things get harder, maybe some character will return. Maybe someone will say, I would like some knowledge. Where can I find that? That's still legal in America. Maybe people will turn back to knowledge as we're looking at in Hosea. But the point is this, let's go back to the spectrum. The first part of the spectrum, the first world part of the spectrum is that we take everything for granted, we expect everything to be perfect, or else despair in our lives. And Paul's end of the spectrum is he's saying, if I suffer, I'm thankful. Because it brings me closer to Jesus. You see how far we need to come in this Christian life? It says, he says it helps me. It helps me identify with my Savior through suffering, any suffering. Look, folks, it's a tall order I'm asking you to think about tonight. And look, I've been a pastor for three years now, and I know that my words that I tell you only go so far with you. I know that the words that I even speak out of the Bible, it's up to you what to do with those words. I know that my words that I'm telling you and yelling at you tonight are not actual trouble in your life. But here's what I'm trying to get you to see tonight. Stop being tr depressed over trouble. If you have persecution, some small persecution, maybe it's even moderate persecution in your life, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate that Christ suffered and that it's going to bring you closer to Christ. Look, I can tell you this about the ministry. I know we've been here in Fresno for five years, but I really look at this ministry as three years because I've been a pastor for three years. And I can tell you this. I can tell you this on our third anniversary. I can tell you this, and my wife will agree with, with me on the, on the pastor's wife side of things. Being a pastor is way harder than I thought it would be. Being a pastor is much more stressful than I ever could have imagined it would be. Much more. I had no idea. I had no idea. But you know what? All of those times that we've gone through, I mean, you just think of an event like this. Let me give you the pastor's perspective. You think of an event like this, it's fun. All the kids are having a blast. Look, I'm having fun with the kids. We're playing ping pong. We're doing all this stuff. Look, it's stressful, though. From my perspective, 
I need everything to go right. I'm constantly thinking about these things. I need to get the soul winners out. We need to get everything lined up. We need the maps. We need the invites. We need everything squared away. It's a stressful situation. And that's not even to say trouble that we've had in this church. But you know when it comes down to it? When it comes down to it, nobody could ever explain to you how hard it is to be a pastor. And I don't want to sound like a whiner up here. But when it comes down to it, and I look back on the hardest times of being a pastor, I'm thankful for those times. You know why? Because I'm a better man for it. I'm a better Christian for what happened in those hard times. And I know that for a fact. It's helped me stay humble. It has helped me to identify with the Bible itself, which is what? The Bible is Jesus Christ. So if your suffering helps you see something in the Bible that you just didn't see before, praise God for that. That's what it's for. That's what Paul is talking about. This is how we know Jesus. Through the Word of God. If you suffer in your life and you never read the Bible and then you get into some trouble and you're like, I need to read the Bible again, praise God you rejoice for that suffering. Because that's the point. Because it brings you to more perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is the mind of Paul. And that is why, you know, I'm not whining about it. I'm thankful for it. I rejoice in it. Anything worth doing is hard. Nothing worth doing. This is why you need the zeal. You can't be one of these people and say, oh, I think maybe I'll do it. I think maybe I won't. Those people have always made me sick, personally, even before I was saved. People are just like, oh, maybe, so and so. Like, whatever, you're going to be a failure in everything you do ever. I don't need salvation to know that. I mean, I thank God for my dad that taught me that. But look, you need the zeal because you need the suffering. You need it so you can know Jesus Christ and you can grow as a Christian. And look, nobody said growth was easy. Nobody said this Christian life was easy. This Christian life is very, very simple, but it is not easy. And that's why you need the zeal so you can push through those times and you can come to a more perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's the point. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.